it's so great to see you again. I feel the same way. It's cool to be back. Yeah, your second stint. Um, the first time around, I got to admit, y- you kind of were you were this sort of mysterious character the first time around, right? You had you had a a, a title of you know special assistant to to Kenny Atkinson, the head coach. Um, you know, you, you look more like a professor off a of campus of, of University of Texas, where I know you're from, uh, than, than, a, than a basketball coach. And you were sort of, it was like, it was almost like a clandestine uh, function that you had. So how would you describe your, uh, your purpose, your role when you were first with the Nets under Kenny Atkinson? Yeah, not any differently than I'd describe my role now, which is just trying to help, you know, trying to assess where I can help the most and um, provide support to people that need it. Uh, you know, obviously focused on the players, try to zoom out when it's helpful to zoom out and provide a wider view to make sure that we don't get lost in the weeds that um, Kenny, you know, at that time we were all new. And so it took a lot of, um, I think all of us were so excited to jump in that we ran the risk of sometimes getting too specific and losing sight of um, the forest for the trees. And then occasionally, once we identified something, zooming in really tight on that and saying, all right, yeah. we need we need a protocol, we need a system to try to consolidate, to sharpen, to speed up something that we were doing. So I, it vacillates between what's needed, but it's always born out of the same um, spirit that we'd preach to our guys, yeah. which is like, be a teammate, try to help. But that was a time where the organization was sort of had coming off rock bottom. I mean, you were coming away from the Pierce Garnett deal. Uh, you you came in and Sean Marks put together this group, and you were bereft of draft picks and bereft of cap space. Um, it, it was almost like a, a a build now, a tear it down, build from the ground up. Um, it was it. A, it seemed to be a new experience for everybody. So. What do you think made it work? The people, you know, I think Sean, Kenny get huge credit for their leadership, that their attitude was always good. We don't have any picks. Mm. Good. Like we're not incentivized to be bad. Like we're going to try our damnedest to um, win and win as soon and as sustainably as we can, but that they weren't distracted by the context. They were focused on the next day and stacking up those days. And that's the only approach that works. Um, you only eat a whale one bite at a time. And those guys kept us all focused on the micro that would turn into the macro. Interesting analogy there, eat a whale. Yeah, so that's you had my whale? touch point. Well, surely, <laughs> who hasn't had a whale? Uh, no, but it, it, there really is nowhere to go but up, I guess, when you with the position that you guys found yourself in at that point. And sometimes that's, you, you, do you find that could, you could be a little more creative, a little more bold because that maybe that pressure isn't there? I hope not. Like yeah. I hope for all of us that we savor the chance to coach at the highest level and be on each other's journeys for just a short little time. You know, even in the best case scenario, Jacques has been here a long time, right? Like yeah. from the, that moment until now, he's been run the whole time, and I, that's a tiny part of Jacques' career and life and. Um, I know that he looks at it the same way I do, which is that he savors the chance to get introduced to, work alongside, um, cheer for, build back up again, depending on how things go. Yeah. Because we all know that it's not going to last forever. And we're all extremely grateful to be here, and we should be. But the, 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 where you find the organization now, as opposed to when you left, um, a lot of the work that was done when you were originally here in that group, um, I'm sure you see a lot of that infrastructure that's that's strong here right now. Definitely, but they are coming off uh, a time where you know, listen, they took a shot with the superstars, it didn't work out, um, but you still find yourself in a pretty good place. And I, because I, because I, I, I hear fans and pundits sort of refer to what's going on now as more of an extension of what was going on when you guys originally came in with Kenny. I don't know, you you have you weren't here for that kind of superstar era, but do you do you find the organization is a little more related to when you first got here and the things that you've built? Yeah, I think 
one of the biggest competitive advantages you can have is continuity and that edges compound and stack over time. And so uh, the biggest edge is people and they've assembled a remarkable set of people, many of whom have were there when I arrived um, and others who have joined in between. And so I have such appreciation for the colleagues I'm getting round two with and a real excitement to get to learn from all the folks that uh, either weren't here or were in such different roles than when I was here last that um, I'm getting to benefit from all the wisdom that they've accrued over this last period of time and hopefully contribute my own represented by my gray hairs that I've picked up <laughs> in other spots in between. Yes. You now, it's almost that you went on a journey after your original stint with the Nets. Uh, I'm, we're going to go back to your beginnings in a little bit, but since the Nets, uh, you you went to Long Island to be the head coach. So there was a jump, right? I mean, you were thrown into being a head coach for the first time. Um, you had always been kind of a special assistant going back to your days at, with the Sixers and the Nets. And then you find yourself as a head coach with the Long Island Nets. Um, was that always your journey that you saw? And, and when you got the chance to do it, what did you learn about yourself? It, it was always the um, goal, but I was lucky that I had incredible mentors that let me sit next to them many of whom were doing it for the first time. So Jason Hooten at Sam Houston State, Jeff McCrary at St. Andrews Episcopal School, <laughs> um, Brett in Philadelphia, Kenny here. Like I sat next to all those guys and they were unselfish enough um, and also like were self-critical enough that I got to observe unfiltered what it looks like to be a head coach and often a head coach in a new situation, a new league, a new mm. team. Uh, at least a new context that, than the experience they'd had previously. So I, I paid attention and I felt really confident that I knew who I was and I knew the things that I could bring to the table and that I, there were surely things that I was going to have as weaknesses that needed to be complemented by the folks I worked with. Um, but even more than that, I know what Nets culture is about. Like I know what Sean, Kenny, Jock, at that time, our ownership, yeah. um, that, like I knew what we were trying to do. And so when you have a North star, you can lead because you know where we're headed. And yeah. so I, I felt really confident, particularly in Long Island, that um, I was going to be able to help grow what Ron Norred and his group had done before and keep it moving forward. Yeah. You're coach of the year, weren't you in the G League? I mean, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> and uh, had a great season there. And then what called you to Australia because you went right from the G League being a head coach for that one year and now you had a chance to be a head coach. Was that the the thing that drew you to Australia? Was it the adventure? What was it? Yeah, all that. A bunch yeah. of factors. I, I loved head, being a head coach. I um, There's so few head coaching jobs available, especially for somebody that didn't play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. You know, like so I I've, was hugely grateful for the chance to do it in the G League and I was excited to continue that. I learned so much being a head coach in a new league, the G League, having not experienced that before. So to now double it up and do it again in a new league, and much not even mentioning a new continent and you know, yeah. and all the different kind of competition um, differences. I also loved it from that it wasn't comfortable, that it was going to be an adventure for our family, that my son was born that year I was when say, I was coaching Long Island. He was born in Long Island. He was you born Long 165th, Island. yep. So okay. he's, he's born in New York. Um, and... For him to get to experience and appreciate what a big world it is out there in a place that I was very familiar with. I coached with the national team for six years and uh, I loved and love Australian basketball and the people there and the spirit of the athletes that grow up in Australia. Um, so for a bunch of reasons, I was really excited to go not into a very different place, but a very different context. It was win now. It was a veteran team. It was a team that uh, was should be and has been the best team in that league. They've won championships in the past several seasons. And I like to think that we laid the foundation for a lot of those things to happen. Yeah, they're a powerhouse right now in uh, in the international scene. How good is the league, the professional league? Now? Very good. Yeah. I, I think people don't fully appreciate what a sporting culture Australia is. Mm -hmm. And kids grow up surrounded, immersed in sport. And so I, they're... I've never had more fun coaching than um, 
surrounded by people who are wired from the time they're little yeah. to give it up for the team, to sacrifice, to make tough plays. Um, There's and- a developmental, um, uh, I guess, feeling about sports in Australia. I know we've talked about how there's an Australian accent or at least that hemisphere in this organization from Sean Marks with New Zealand. And, you know, the, the performance team has, I think about three Australians on yep. it. And, um, there's, there's very much, I think that this organization, the Nets have tapped into that culture for sure of, so you were able to see it firsthand Truly. with the national team and with the professional. And there's, there's been, you know, they were so ahead in sports science yeah. that that edge persists and reverberates out into today we're not the only lead you know we were one of the first teams i think to have as many aussies as we do roaming around Mm. um but when you look there's a lot of other teams that have hired the best people and many of those best people have trained in australia or grew up in australia and you see the same thing across epl F1, <laughs> we're not yeah. the only ones yeah. that are hip to that. You Now, you got hooked up with uh, the Australian national team. Was that through Brett Brown? Because yeah. I know you were in Philadelphia for a while. If people just, the context of your life, um, you, you, you were at Sam Houston State, as you mentioned, and I think that's when you met Sam Hankey, right? He was down with the, with the Rockets, and eventually he would go to Philadelphia where we know the process, you know, was Sam Hankey's baby. And um, he hired Brett Brown and you came in and you were a special assistant with Brett. And then, uh, and then that continued over to Kenny. And then you went to, as we mentioned, Long Island, Australia, but you were an assistant coach of the Australian national team. Brett Brown was the head coach. That's right. Right. So, so but he brought you he, over there or you did, I'd, what was the time? He had just there? finished before I started. And so okay. he was handed it off to his assistant coach. Um, <laughs> and our Australian Federation is a small, you know, it's it's not uh, big he, business. He coached the 2012. He was in, in London. I That's think. right. He was that there, was his right? last major tournament. Okay, and and so from that, he that. named Sixers head coach in 13 and sort of handed the reins over to Andre Lamanis, who I served with for six years. Uh, so I was very fortunate to get to be a part of two World Cups, an Olympics, and an Asia Cup. Um, and our good friend Adam Caporn, I worked alongside him mm-hmm. for a couple of those tournaments. Um, but Brett's life and love for where basketball can take you was something that I was deeply connected with him on very early. And I pestered him our whole first year about international basketball and all his experiences and all his travel. And when our season ended, um, I asked him, I said, Does, do you think there's a chance that I could try to volunteer for one of these teams as they get ready for the world mm-hmm. cup in 2014? And he said, what about Australia? Like they need the help. I don't know if they do it. They don't never had non Australians, working for him besides me, you know, himself, him and Brian Gordon were the only guys. Um, but they welcomed me in. I was the only foreigner. And uh, at the start, it was like, we'll see where it goes. And by the end of that tournament, six weeks later, I was scouting half the games and hmm. crying in the locker room when we got beat on a buzzer beater and um, had never felt such a connection to the spirit of a team and the pride that they all felt to represent Australia. And to this day, being the head coach uh, for the two games in the FIBA qualifiers to represent Australia as the head coach of the Boomers, albeit not with the NBA roster, mm-hmm. uh, that's the proudest career accomplishment that I have. And then you go down there, they, you're a head coach in the Australian League, but you know you mentioned uh, you know, the connection with Brett Brown. That was a similar situation to the Kenny Atkinson regime here, where with Brett Brown coming into Philadelphia, that was at a low point with the Sixers and trying to build that up. These are great training grounds for you, yeah. right? I mean, I th- I'm sure there were a lot of similarities when you got to the Nets the first time as there were when you got to the Sixers the first time. I certainly felt like the pitches were coming a little bit slower. <laughs> the second time the around. Se- yeah, you, you know, yeah. that some of that is just generalized experience, yeah. but there was also some specific kinds of puzzles that we were trying to, that we we partially solved in those first three years I had with the Sixers that we were able to um, deal with here in Brooklyn the same way. I'm so lucky that my introduction to NBA basketball, because I was a high school coach, a college coach. um, So I, I was not indoctrinated and I I didn't know what I didn't know about the NBA. Uh, And so to have my first four bosses be Brett, Sam, Kenny, and Sean, you're not going to find a more dedicated, curious, relentless set of 
basketball thinkers um, with the worldliness that those four guys possess. So I, I owe those four a great deal. You're at Sam Houston State after you, you – so let, let's go back. Let's 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 take a step back and then move forward again. I'm feeling old because you mentioned a little bit of your your basketball career. Um, were you a player at any one point? Played in high school. High school. I came to basketball late. I know you can play because I've seen you out there playing. <laughs> yeah, that's generous. I um, <laughs> yeah, I, I came to basketball late. I played sports in Texas all growing up. Of course, yeah. that means football. Not built Austin. Absolutely where you're from yep. right. Yeah. Um, so my my days as an offensive lineman and tight end were. Destined were for, you an offensive lineman? Of course, at one I was. Because a Texas, tall kid. Yeah. It, it in in grammar school. I mean, what are we talking about <laughs> yeah, here? Exactly. Well, when did you is, have you, a growth you've spurt? Jumped to the end of the novel. Where <laughs> we see we see where this thing is headed. But, I know um, what I know what high school football is like in Texas. Yeah, so yeah. I wasn't I wasn't big, but I was slow. You know, so <laughs> you, that, you had the, that. you had the double value. <laughs> yeah. So I, I certainly grew up loving sport, but I didn't I didn't even know that you could have a career in sport other than as a professional player or something. Um, so I came to basketball late, loved my experiences playing and, and being on teams in high school. Um, but it wasn't until I was about to graduate that I even considered coaching. And that was through a conversation through a mentor where I was laying out that I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was really eager for it to be good for the world, something I could have a family and be a good dad and husband with, and something that I could compete in because I loved the energy that competition brought. Um, and... I didn't know if that was going to be political science or public affairs or a nonprofit or law school or what, but um, he mentioned coaching. He said, you love sport. Like, have you ever thought about that? And so I ended up spending part of my freshman year at University of Texas volunteering, coaching middle school kids. And the first week of that made it clear to me that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's hard. You know, you mentioned one of the goals that you had there was having a family, um, that's not always probably the easiest thing to do when it comes to coaching. I certainly think that the biggest decision anybody makes in their life is who their partner is going to be. Yeah. And uh, I nailed that one. So um, without... <laughs> Your wife's name? Lauren. Lauren. Now, when did you meet Lauren? I met her in high school. Okay. I invested early. Wow. I was an <laughs> early round investor in Lauren <laughs> yes. Incorporated. And um, yeah, her positivity and... Uh, appreciation and always looking on the bright side fits well within the life of a coaching family. Um, but we, I, I think it's really well suited for us. She has been on a similarly challenging kind of career path. She's a child neurologist that specializes in epilepsy, did her training at Columbia uh, Presbyterian at 165th. And both of us were chasing really hard things alongside of each other. So we mm. had real appreciation for the sacrifices that were going to go into that. Um, we had Theo four and a half years ago here in New York. And so up until that point, we'd been together a long time and we knew that we wanted to be parents. Uh, and we knew we wanted that to sit at the top of our pyramid of what we wanted to focus on. Um, but because we were a little older, I think we had, we're better prepared for the sacrifices that were going to go into that. Yeah. I mean, there's a nomadic existence to coaching. You've already been, I mean, your son Theo has already lived in three continents and he's four. That's right. You know, yeah. so there's a nomadic existence that goes with this. There's the hours that you put in. They're not conventional kind of thing. Um, so I guess the fact that you've known each other, you and Lauren have known each other for so long, you knew what each other were about. Totally. This is not a surprise. We've been teammates yeah. that whole time. And that's how we think about it and talk about it is what's good for our team and, uh, jumping from place to place has been amazing for us. The experiences, mm. the learning, um, and this decision to come back to Brooklyn was a really easy one for us in part because we had the comfort level and familiarity with Jock and with Sean and with the Nets itself. Um, but also because this is the place that we'd love for Theo to grow up and, um, one of the cities that we feel the most connected to of all the places we've traveled. Normally, when you think of Texas, you think a certain way, but Austin is sort of like the Brooklyn of Texas. I mean, there's a little, it's a different thinking there. Definitely. More. Nets would be playing in Austin if, this year. If we just had gotten Sydney on the schedule, we <laughs> would have hit every hit metropolitan every area yes. I've coached in. Yes. Paris, Austin, 
Philly, Houston. Sydney's going to be tough to work into the. Uh, I don't think so. Schedule. I've done some research. <laughs> There's some good flights. You think so? I think we might Maybe. be able to just do a little right. quick little puddle hopper. The jet lag it might be an issue for later on Maybe in the for season. You. It may come back. I feel good about it. Yeah. No. Um. I. I. Yeah. I. I keep getting. I, I have some people I know in Australia that keep inviting me out there, and I'm like, wow, it's it's a commitment. Let's go. You and me. It's a commitment. You can do the first road, Carino <laughs> experience. All right. On Let's Bondi see. Beach. Bondi Beach. So yeah, I just let's let's. This is like an aside. I like to go off on tangents because I know that um, when you left Australia, you said one of the toughest things you had to do was leave your surfboard. <laughs> so is that a? Uh, was that? Were you a surfer in Austin? Hell no. No, you learned that's something one you look up at me in, in the set, and you would quickly be able to identify <laughs> where the Texan is. So that was just a uh, you were joking around about the surf. No, part? hell, yeah, I got obsessed. I, I surfed every day of COVID. I was in the water. Really? Um, this was where in Sydney. In Sydney, yeah. So oh, after our season, COVID, ended, you were there. I yeah. started the. I started from scratch and YouTubed and got a coach and went out there and struggled in the wintertime and learned um, and just enough to be dangerous. Me and all the Brazilian backpackers with 12 packs you know there's coach <laughs> weaver out there with his covid beard and looking like a drowned rat but uh it is about as zen a sport as you can say, find there seems to be a spiritual connection yeah, that's incredible surfing, right different such a different experience um up to that point truthfully the the closest i'd been to it was at a mini camp we hosted where we invited some of the players we took a class with some red bull coaches who taught us they were you know worked with big wig surfers and real real athletes and uh, they took us out there and the coaches had gone first and then the players were going to go and most of the players didn't want to do it and the one of the exceptions was jared allen from round rock texas and even more <laughs> if it can be more landlocked, <laughs> more landlocked than yeah. austin it is um <laughs> certainly spiritually it's a pretty landlocked place first wave jared 610 going right like yeah. he's Athlete. hawaii 50 yeah. you know a throwback big fro coming down the lineup <laughs> Like one of those dudes is an athlete. Like that cat right there, <laughs> yeah. pretty impressive. But there's a spiritual thing you mentioned, a Zen-like thing about it, and I, 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 um, I think there's a more holistic thing going on right now when it comes to player development. When it comes to you know uh, professional athletes, you know we we just saw all this stuff about you know Aaron Rodgers going into a darkness retreat. Um, I've talked to recently a young player like Noah Clowney who uh, talked a lot about mental health issues. And I know you go to every uh, arena now in, in the NBA and there's a, there's a quiet room that they can go to uh, before games. And I, I feel like, you know, there's that aspect that and maybe it's been embraced in years past, but I feel like that's getting a little more at the forefront. I'm so right lucky now. to be coaching in this era. I think yeah. like all of us, you know, there's, um, there's more room for a guy, uh, an open-minded guy from Austin, Texas, <laughs> for sure. Learned how to, he taught himself to surf in Truly, Australia, yes. that there's more of a function now that might've been looked at sideways years ago in the NBA, but now it's sort of like, well, we're treating everything holistically. And this is a part of that now. Yeah. And I think, I think those people have always been in the NBA, like Jock Vaughn, didn't just wake up in 2023 as erudite and worldly word, and like interested, curious in yeah. the broader world. Um, I, th I think frankly, like NBA basketball players have been stereotyped negatively over time. You know, the whole shut up and dribble stuff is anathema to how certainly this place operates and the people that we um, want to work with and feel like we can help the most. So I, I've always been drawn to those kind of people and that's part of what made Jock somebody that I was so eager to work with yeah. again and be a teammate of again is his clear eyed, relaxed, organized kind of brilliance that is a really incredible set of skills that he's cultivated in his career. Man, just a just such a positive energy around totally. him. You know, he's just, uh, some people are energy givers. I mean, John is an energy giver. Um, you used erudite and anathema in, in the last like two minutes, which is, goes to why I call you the professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, this broad range, it, it actually, you could see why now you were somebody who was eager to 
broaden his horizons by going to Australia. And then from Australia, you end up in France last year coaching as a head coach. Um, but in between, you had the assistant coach spot with the Rockets. Um, another, I mean, they must, does the bat signal go out? <laughs> like we're at the lowest of lows. <laughs> so let's go find Will Weaver. That's Is funny. there a Will I, Weaver bat signal that I, goes out? I certainly feel um, like the luck that one has to have I'll, I'll tell a story about Brett. So when we were in Philly, Brett Brown, Brett yeah. Brown, um, maybe in the first week or two, he's, you know, he and I spent a lot together, time together. He said, Willie, we're never going to ha- get to do this again. Like we are at the top of pro sport, one of the proud franchises, getting to build it truly from scratch. Like who gets this chance? Yeah. Which tells you a lot about him and how he's wired and why he's so <laughs> special. Um, it turns out me. Like I get that chance yeah. <laughs> over and over Three again. Three times. Yeah, it, it it's hard for me to know how much of those experiences are baked into my worldview and how much I would have been like this regardless. But um, I think that if I was handed the keys to a team that won the champion, if I was coaching the Denver Nuggets this season, uh, I think I would take it the exact same approach, which is like, how can we augment our strengths and mitigate our weaknesses. What systems can we put in place to serve our players so that they can improve and that they can feel ready to perform? And how can we all fulfill our roles, the players, the coaches, everybody, uh, in a way that we can all be proud of and that we can enjoy the privilege of getting to be around a part of the NBA. Um, And so I, I truly come at it from that sort of perspective with a lot of the other stuff being details that I think are more or less interchangeable, you know, the specific play names and ATOs and coverages, they're important, but they pale in comparison to the ability to scale um, your process. Yeah. If you were coaching Denver though, I don't think I would advise you to change, just get it to Jokic, let him, let him go do it. Turns out, (laughs) <laughs> good players like that make make yeah. us all look like good coaches. You know, you mentioned. Uh, I want to go back to your days. You, you you're at Sam Houston State. You meet Sam Hankey. You know, he goes on. People know Sam Hankey as the the GM in Philly, and the term "the process" came out of that. It gets mocked a little bit now. Um, they just had a ton of draft picks, and it uh, a lot of them didn't work out for whatever reason. Um, but was there was it a little simplistic to say that the process was just about let's lose so many games so that we can get draft picks or yes. yeah yeah what was yeah what I, th- I think that? that the the thing that's often a lot of times lost on people is um process was not a word we used in our office other than to talk about are we doing things the right way in the hopes that they give us the best chance to earn whatever success we have. And so um, Joel, Ben, Jeremy Grant, Robert Covington, like all those guys, TJ McConnell, um, those were all guys that were given opportunities that may not have gotten those kinds of opportunities and other teams. Mm. And that I think was the outlier was the fact that we were playing such youth and trusting and developing and and giving the most valuable resource NBA minutes to guys that weren't ready yet. And that I think is skimmed over by the broader, um, you know, NBA uh, cognoscenti, but we had a set of people in that group that went on to do amazing things. Mm. And many of them for the Sixers, either directly on their teams like Joe, the reigning MVP or um, indirectly, whether they were traded for other good players, Tobias Harris and others that have, that have landed there um, over time. I'm the only thing I can really speak to is my experience, which was I learned an immeasurable amount from Sam and Brett and the way they organize things and the spirit more importantly that they brought to um, the, the people and the stories that I could tell you about, how they invested in those guys um, would make your hair stand up. Really? Make my hair hair stand up? Can you share one of those stories if you're going to make my hair stand up? Yeah. (laughs) I I, I think that the 
you know, the, I'll keep the specific player out of it, but the loss of a family member right. and, um, you know, f- flying halfway around the world to sit next to him with your arm around him, that's not a characteristic that I suspect many folks would have necessarily attributed to Sam. And a big part of it was what, because Sam would never share those kinds of details because mm. that's not why he behaved the way he behaved. Mm. Um, Brett Brown left a preseason game and had somebody else coach so that he could go be with that player in that yeah. moment. And those are things that you feel as a part of a team. Yeah. And that I think add up to um, relationships that are built to last and have the potential to change somebody's life. Do you sometimes re- do you sometimes just get overwhelmed by a sense of gratitude for these people that you've had in your life? It's all I think about. Yeah. All I think about are is how lucky I am and how I want to spend the rest of my life around teammates that I can learn from. You ended up uh, spending a year in France. We talked about that last last year. What was uh, what was that? It, what did that experience, you know, not only being a, a head coach again, but also being in a in a in a country like France and where basketball is, you know, started to become incredibly. And I was it was there was a lot of uh, attention this year with uh, Wembenyama coming out. But you lead you you went back to the NBA. You were close. I think that the Thunder considered you for head coaching job at one point, but now you leave again. I mean. You know that has to, it's a courageous decision again to leave the NBA and go go to Paris. Thank you. I I didn't think of it in those terms, but I was very focused on the chance to learn again, not only basketball but all the things that come along with a new country, a new continent, a new league, new staff. Um, and I was really drawn to the ownership, Eric Schwartz and David Kahn were super clear minded about what they were trying to do, where their team was at, the stage of their franchise. And I love working with people who have a clear goal in mind and um, are rational enough to say, look, we're willing to accept these kinds of risks. These are risks that we want to stay away from. So they were in a transition. They had just started four seasons ago. They were still a new club with big ambition. And I, I believe that will be realized very soon. Um, to play at the highest level of European basketball, but they were entering into their first season of international competition. So in Europe, you play one day a week in your domestic league, um, and only if you're selected, you get to play an international competition that increases your games to two days a week. So after coming down to the last game and almost getting relegated the season before, um, they were really focused on not only not getting relegated, but also representing themselves well in international competition for the first time. So I was lucky that they identified me as somebody that they were targeting to come help them. And um, in the meantime, I'm the one that benefited because I got to coach some amazing players that had NBA experience, as well as some rising stars that will play in the NBA that had been drafted by Boston and Denver and stashed with them um, and compete against a guy like Victor who Turns out it's pretty good. Yeah, when you when you watch Victor Wembanyama play in in France, um, I'm sure you're you're starting to think about like, what would this look like in the NBA? Is this there's so much hype around him? Is it warranted at this point? Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it was incredible to get to feel that um, we because of our players and their efforts and their diligence, we did a really good job defending Victor. Whereas that was a that was a a rare thing in that yeah. in this past season over there. Um, it's not like you have a Mikel Bridges that you can that's right. put on them. Yeah. But we had guys that were committed to it, and we approached that side of the floor with NBA schemes, and that might take a little while for him to adjust to. But man, is he a special person, and that shows up on the court. And he's going to play in a system with uh, Greg Popovich. And you've you've worked with all guys who are kind of from that tree sure. a little bit. Uh, Brett Brown, Kenny Atkinson, you know that group. Even Sean Marks here, so you know the kind of training that he's going to get when he's there. And more importantly, how he's going to grow with his body, with his um, the experience, leadership. I ran into R.C. Buford in Austin just recently and was joking about his French and. Um, <laughs> 
laughing about the fact that I suspect the San Antonio may be playing in the next Paris game or two. Probably. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll sneak ours in here against the Cavs while we can. So you got, yeah, well, I, I want to get to Paris in a second, but the, you, you didn't directly work for the Spurs, but like we said, you grew up in Austin and, and you've worked for all these guys who were from the Spurs tree. Um, so you don't, you don't have the, the direct experience. You've got sort of secondhand experience, but that seems to be the secret sauce in the NBA, right? Whatever they started there, it's branched out. It's an incredi- what do you feel incredible like the set of people. ingredient is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the is ingredient- Because like you that's said, it. People that's always the ingredient, yeah. but it's how do you identify those people? How do you train those people? How do you retain those people? Um, you know, whether it's Sam Presti or Quinn Snyder or- um, you know, folks that I've gotten to know over the years that I haven't worked with for a season. Um, there's a lot of the same traits that I talked about with Jock, a, a curiosity, a deeply competitive nature. Um, the respect I have for all those folks is immense. And, you know, growing up in Austin, the Spurs were also basically our pro team. And so when I worked at the University of Texas, Quinn and those guys were using our gym for practices sometimes when their building was busy. Yeah. So I, I certainly have a long standing love and appreciation for a lot of those people. And a holistic thing. Like, you know, Greg Popovich is known for Truly. not just being so focused on everything in my life is about basketball. That's right. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that adventure spirit helped you out in Paris. What was, were you in Paris coaching? So what was, what, um, what do they think of basketball in Paris? Like, is it is it is it a is it a like maybe soccer is here? It reminded or, me a lot of what yeah people think of basketball in Texas, which is that it sometimes conflicts with football, <laughs> albeit a different <laughs> code of football or a spring football. Um, or yeah. no, there's a super passionate set of fans throughout France for yeah. basketball, but it exists mostly sort of like college towns, and so you go to Cholet or. Um, you know, Graveline Dunkirk, and you find incredible fan bases that have been going to games their whole lives and care deeply about those teams. The cities are oftentimes sort of um, not thought of as places for basketball. Um, you know, maybe like LA is sometimes stereotyped or New York is like they've come late crowds and, you know, there's been that sort of- There's a lot of other things going on. There's other things yeah. going on. And it's also a place that doesn't have continuity over decades. People come and live there for a period of time and may not stay there for 50, 60 years as often as they do in these smaller towns. But um, I found such love for the sport and such appreciation for where their, where the sport is going with the talent and um, really exciting things that you see represented by the number of French players yeah. playing at really high levels all over the world. So the the team is going over there in January. Um, what is something, having spent a year, I know you haven't spent your lifetime there, but a year, and I, knowing you, you probably really immersed yourself in, in Paris and the culture. Um, what's something that, that you would want your players when they go over there to, to experience? Mm. That's a great question. Hmm. It's certainly food related. Um, I think they have good French food. <laughs> the simple pleasure of a unstructured walk with some croissant, a coffee, get lost for a minute or two, even if it's just that brief. Um, that to me is is quintessentially Parisian. And I, I know because of this organization and having done an international trip with them before to Mexico City, that we will we won't let anybody miss out on the chance to soak up what it means to get to represent our entire league in a place like that. Yeah. It's a, it's a great opportunity for guys to, to experience that and go through that. Um, a couple of things just before we, before we wrap things up here with you and I really appreciate you, uh, spending the time with us. It's I been a real burden. Enjoyed the, <laughs> yes. Um, you're, you're a guy from Austin. I always think of Austin as a music city. So are you a music fan? Deeply, yeah, yeah, it's a problem. Is there a is there a specific type? Or you you would seem to me to be the kind of guy that would listen to like, you know, country music as well as like Brazilian folk music or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, my tastes are wide. Um, one of the earliest connections Jacques and I had was I think 
besides me, he might have the widest musical taste of any of my colleagues. Really? But we've already had some great staff conversations about West Coast hip hop, um, the Sun City era of record labels and um, what Motown represented and how that culture has spread all across the world. Um, I, I'm surrounded on this staff by uh, audiophiles. So it's yeah. going to be a fun year. Have you been to Austin City Limits? Of course. The festival? Many times. Yeah. What was the best set that you remember? What was, the, what was the most fun um, you had there? That's a good question. You know, my brother uh, has written and produced electronic dance music. Really? And he's exposed me to a whole world of producers and DJs and performers that I haven't. Um, so I, I saw Bass Nectar there and really liked that set. Bass Nectar. Mm. I don't know them. Yeah. That's there, an EDM? There's idea? time. Yeah. Oh, okay. We can dub out on a later <laughs> date, you and I. <laughs> I'm more of a, a like a Pearl Jam. Sure. Uh, even, a, you know, a Jason Isbell, uh, Frank Turner, people yep. like that that I'm sure have all come Love through it. Austin at many I'm times. I'm pretty sure Eddie Vedder and I would get along great. I, I feel like there's an Eddie Vedder kind of vibe mm. from you. Thank you. Yeah. And this is something I see. This is something I should have known about you being from Austin that it's like kind of in your blood music, but now we can talk about stuff. Uh, it's the I want you to give me stuff and I'll give you stuff. I'm ready. To listen to. That's yeah. awesome. Um, when, when we uh, wrap these things up, I always uh, talk about Barclay Center has this Oculus, you know, this video board outside, right? And if, uh, if Will Weaver was going to be uh, somehow occupying Barclay Center, and you could put something up on that board as sort of your personal mantra or something you want, Ooh. a message or an image, something you'd want to put up there uh, that represents you. What do you think it might be? Wow, what a heavy question. <laughs> um, I think what I love about New York is that it's a hard place to live that it's filled with people who are all trying to do hard stuff and this is the only place that they can do it. And so it's filled with that kind of energy of people that have chosen to be here and are energetically pursuing things. Um, and so I, I think back about the tradition of basketball in this city and the, the way that people playing on playgrounds in this region of the country has reverberated out over time and space and changed the world in meaningful ways. Um, and so rather than a specific person, I think the image of an outdoor basketball court in New York, in Brooklyn, um, whether it was the cagers, you know, many, many, many years ago, um, with the chain on the hoop, hundred percent. Yeah, Lou Alcindor, Wilt Chamber, like all I think the. That's kind of the spirit behind the uh, the gray floor, that right. Barclay Center, right? To yeah. represent that. That a zoomed out court. picture of that with people surrounding the court. That to me is New York basketball. Yeah. Or alternatively, be be proud of doing hard stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Not be afraid of it. Good for all of us. Yeah. That's been. Uh, that kind of sums it up, right? We've just talked about the whole time is. <laughs> You going into situations that are not easy. I've got a five-year-old that's not in school right now waiting on me at home. I will, I'll be plowing into that hard stuff here do. pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. Will Weaver, always great to talk to you. Thanks. Welcome back to Brooklyn. Cheers, buddy.